Welcome to Astronomy 103. In this module, we will try to understand the view of the night sky all the way from the pre-Greek era up to the Copernican Revolution to Newton. Ancient Greek Astronomy. Ancient astronomers looked at the night sky and saw that stars are mostly unchanging. If you do that today, you also basically look at the night sky and night after night, basically the stars are mostly unchanging in terms of the relative position to each other. We talked about how it appears as a sphere. And so the stars appear to be sphere because it's so far away from the Earth. However, if you look at the stars carefully, the stars are not completely unchanging. The Greeks noticed that they were bodies that moved relative to the background of quote unquote fixed stars. These bodies were called planets by, Greek, by the Greeks, which is for a wandering star. The interesting point about these planets is that the motion was fairly complicated. And the problem of the motion of planets confounded the Greeks and early astronomers until Kepler, and in fact, Newton came along much, much later. Why is it so hard? Well, you know each day the celestial sphere appears to rotate about the axis through the poles. Basically, the Earth rotates, and so the entire sphere appears to rotate. And the sun, moon, and stars move with it along a circular path around the north star, Polaris. These stars appear to be permanently fixed in this sphere, right? The moon appears to move once around, once a month from, um, uh, once a month from west to east through the zodiac constellations due to its revolution around the Earth, and the sun basically also seems to move from west to, from west to east through the constellation zodiac, but basically due to the rotation or the revolution of the Earth going around the sun. So these motions seem to be perfectly circular. At least they are circular relative to the celestial sphere. So it's natural to think of the motions of the heavens to follow perfect circles. But the planets don't seem to move this way. What do we mean by that? We can take example of the following. Okay, The path of the plan planets appear to be like a series of loops. Right, So you can basically see in this particular illustration, this is the uh, planet Mars. It goes around the Earth. right, And basically at one point... It was on um, July 7th, 2003, it was at this point, it moved, it stopped a month later, and the reverse direction until it went back on its original path um, after October. Okay, So this backward motion is known as retrograde motion. So what's going on here? Why does it follow this motion? So what is retrograde motion? So each planet has an overall apparent motion from west to east. Okay? But they don't always move west to east. In fact, during part of its motion, each planet changes the direct direction. It moves backwards east to west for a time and then turns again to move west to east. So this is way different from all the other objects that are seen in the night sky. Right? Um, well, so there's also another strange coincidence. When Jupiter and Saturn are on the same direction of the sky, the retrograde motion starts and stops at the same time, as if they're synchronous. The same is true basically when Mars and, or Jupiter or Mars and Saturn are in the same part. So basically, when you have Mars or Jupiter and Saturn in the same part of the night sky, they all seem to synchronize among themselves. Finally, the fastest planets, the planets that move the fastest across the night sky, Mercury and Venus, are always the same part of the sky as the Sun. All right? So for instance, the angle between Mercury and the Sun is never greater than 28 degrees, which means you only see Mercury for a brief time before sunrise and a brief time before sunset, if at all. Okay? The angle between Venus and the Sun is also never than 47 degrees. So in fact, Mercury and Venus are never opposite the sky relative to the Sun. So you only see basically Mercury and Venus for a few hours after sunset and maybe a few hours before sunrise. So these are observations. These are things that people see. Okay? And to explain observation, right, a model must be constructed. And good model must be explaining this observation and make additional predictions. This is the essence of the scientific method. You have observations, you build a model, i.e. a theory. And the theory must not only explain what you see or have seen already, but will also make predictions for stuff you have not seen yet. So this is the essence of the scientific method, and the Greeks are clearly aware of this. So they were in the process of trying to build models to explain the motion of the planets. So it took them a long time, but in 140 AD, Ptolemy devised a model of the solar system with the Earth at rest near the center. Each planet in his system revolved around a large circle called epicycle, and the center of, the cycle, and the center of this epicycle revolved around the Earth. So Ptolemy's system did not have the beauty 
of basically that Plato had thought about, but it's but it was extraordinarily accurate. In fact, it was so accurate that basically it was used for 15 centuries afterwards to predict the planet positions on, of planets in the sky. Okay, so how does this work? Okay, so this is basically um, uh, what uh, the Ptolemaic model looks like. So Earth's at the center of the universe. There's the epicycle. The epicycle moves in a in a small circle around a larger circle which which turns around so this thing is like a wheel that spins at the end of a larger wheel and the entire thing moves around and so every now and then what happens to the planet basically as it moves on the inner part of the epicycle appears to move backward in the sky so basically it turns out that this can produce reproduce the overall west east motion of each planet all right if you look down and the east and west motion up ahead, reproduce the west-east motion of the planet. So this thing moves the uh, overall um, west-east motion, and then basically as the epicycle goes, as the planet moves on the inner part of the epicycle, it reproduces the east to west motion, right? Okay, so in a few animations that follow, we're going to basically show how this basically works. Okay, so if you imagine a fixed background of stars in the sky, here's my fixed background of stars, right? And as a planet moves around in its epicycle, it will basically um, appear to move against the whoops against the background of stars in the west-east direction. As it moves the inner part, it basically reverses the direction before it comes back again and moves in the original direction. So that's how Ptolemy's model works to explain epicycles, and it's a very accurate model. It basically was used for 1,500 years and and uh, without much um, uh, modification. Okay, so this is very successful, used for 1500 years to predict planetary motion. Okay, so Tomley had to basically use um, one epicycle for each planet to explain its retrograde motion and use different times for how, take, for how long each planet goes around its epicycle and the time it takes to adjust the epicycle to go around the sun. So he could basically adjust this model to get um, uh, accuracy, right? Now, what happens is that as you want to get more and more accuracy, okay, um, so to, to explain, to explain the observation, you just adjust the parameters of the model. So to get more and more accuracy, you can add more and more epicycles. So for instance, like there's an epicycle and another epicycle, epicycle and another epicycle, epicycle. So basically, it's a complicated model, but it does work, right? There's no arguing that this model doesn't work. Okay, so um, pace aside, after the ancient Greeks, after Ptolemy, um, pace of scientific discovery is slow, right? Rome conquered Greece, and then northern tribes conquered Rome, and then astronomy in Europe was basically dead for a thousand years, okay? Uh, the only people that kept it alive were Chinese and Muslim astronomers, right? And the Muslim astronomers were keenly aware of Ptolemy's model, and so they basically kept refining it um, um, uh, for basically the, the medieval period, okay? Uh, <coughs> And so when the Arabs conquered uh, Spain, right, a lot of the knowledge from the ancient Greeks were passed back into Europe around the 13th century in Spain, right? And the translations made into Europe basically spurred the Renaissance in Europe, okay? Um, people were interested in astronomy throughout this period. And so, for instance, basically, uh, they continued to study astronomy. And so, in, and in particular, some of the of the leaders in Europe sponsored some of this work. So, for instance, Alfonso X, King of Castile, sponsored much of this work in Toledo, which is in Spain, right? And he learned a little about the complex, complex models to explain the motion of the planet. And after he heard about that, he's rumored to have said, if, there, if I had been there with God when he made the world, I would have meant many things so that they would be much better made than he had made them. So he's just saying, it's way too complicated. Why isn't there, why, why wouldn't he have just made it much more simpler? Simple. Okay. Enter Copernicus, right? So there's a few people basically who become very important, right? So there's Copernicus, Copernicus, Tycho Brahe, Kepler, Galileo, and Newton. This all happened around and after the time of the Renaissance, right? So Copernicus was a contemporary of uh, Christopher Columbus, basically born in Poland about 20 years before Copernicus sailed to uh, the what is now the West Indies. Uh, so he went to Italy, all right, and where he translated Greek text and learned about this aristocracy system with the sun as center of the universe. And he got whole of some Islamic manuscripts which were critical in forming his thinking. Right? 
So when he returned to Poland, he began calculations um, it, there, and he he argued that the rotation of such a sphere can be assumed by Earth rotating about a fixed axis while the sphere is stationary. Okay, so rather than having the sphere rotate around the Earth, he said, well, the Earth rotates. And basically to explain the motion of the sun, he said, well, maybe the Earth rolls, rolls around the sun. Okay. <coughs> now, what he also said, right, was that um, they were trying to reduce the number of epicycles, was that if Earth was just another planet, Okay, and all planets move out of the sun, so he basically put the sun at the center of the universe. Then he could explain the retrograde motion, right, that astronomers could not explain for 2,000 years without epicycles. All right? So this is a great simplification that he proposed that, that could have worked. So let's see how that works. Right? So Copernicus placed the sun at the center, and all the planets had to move around the sun in perfect circles. Right? Uh, you could still adjust the speed of the orbits, but he found in order for this work, he had to place the planets in the order of Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Okay, so just by this, you could basically put Mercury and Venus basically on the same side of the Sun in this night sky, and basically uh, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn appropriately as well. And he also made the planets that orbit closer uh, to the Sun faster. All right, so. Mercury and Venus have periods or time to for one orbit shorter than one year. So Earth orbits around the Sun in one year. So he sort of knew that already. Um, and basically, Earth moves faster than the outer planets, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. All right, and you can see basically the stars are on the outer edge of this stuff. Right, this is obviously not to scale. This is Copernicus' original manuscript. He didn't draw things to scale, and basically, basically placed these um, uh, 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 planets in this configuration. Okay, so how do you get metric rate motion in this context? Well, he was perhaps inspired all right, by the fact that if you are walking with somebody or running with somebody and you're faster with, than someone, right? so as you're advancing toward them, like, you can see basically that both of you are moving um, forward in direction. All right? But as you pass someone and you look at them, you might notice if you're faster that that person appears to be moving backwards and so the backward motion is just a illusion right that the fact that that comes from the fact that you're passing somebody so similarly you could do the same thing with planets for instance a faster planet that passes a a, a slower planet will make it seem like the slower planet is moving backwards relative to the faster planet's night, night sky so when the Earth, which everyone is sitting on, passes the outer planet, the outer planet appears to move backwards relative to the background stars. The same effect that you see when you pass a car on a highway. So if you watch that car you pass on a highway, it appears to move backwards relative to the background trees or background um, sky or background buildings, even though you and the other car are move, both moving in the same direction. So retrograde motion happens when the Earth passes an outer planet or is passed by an inner planet. Here's another animation showing how this works, right? So there's basically Earth and Mars. It's advancing, it's advancing. And now as the Earth starts to pass Mars, it slows down and starts to go backwards because basically that's what that's the angle you're looking at and before basically advancing uh, along in the sky. So it's an apparent effect, right? But it does give you something that looks like retrograde motion. So those are the points of retrograde motion right there, when the Earth is passing the outer planet. Okay, so what is interesting about this is that Copernicus' model was simpler, all right, um, and he had to rely on, on copies of observations a thousand years old, and so basically he was trying to create a model which is simpler, but it was not more accurate, all right. So, uh, the so what uh, Copernicus found was a simpler model, but however, uh, in order for his model to really work w as well as Ptolemaic model, which was extraordinarily accurate, he too had to add small epicycles to explain the uh, deviation from from the motion of the planets. Right. So the result was Copernicus' full system was as complicated as Ptolemy's model, no more accurate. All right, so there's a missing ingredient, who is Johannes Kepler, which we'll, we'll, who we will meet next. 
Okay, so let's talk briefly aside about scientific method. All right, the scientific method is involves observation, theory, and theory makes predictions, and testing these predictions with observations. Okay, so a theory must make numerical predictions, basically quantitative predictions, and those predictions must be testable. It's not enough to say something will happen. You must say how it will happen and in what manner it does happen. So, so, and in order for a theory to be scientific, it must be testable, right? So, uh, the predictions must be testable, and to um, the predictions have to be correct within the accuracy of the observations. If it is possible, then the theory can, if, if it's possible to show the theory can be proven false by making uh, a series of observations, then the theory can be called a scientific theory. If you can't falsify a theory, it's not really a scientific theory. Right. <coughs> okay. Astonishingly, the laws of nature can be vastly more accurate than the observation on which they're based. And then maybe when you get things right, okay, the things that appear coincidences are not basically accidental uh, results at all. We'll see what this means in the concept of Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn in a little bit. Okay. So according to scientific method, you does not distinguish between the Copernican model and the Ptolemy model. They both give basically the same sort of predictions, right? Because the Ptolemy model is what we call a tuned model. But so is Copernican model, because you have to basically tune everything to make it work. The Copernican model is slightly simpler, it makes it more appealing, but there's no law that says nature has to be simple. Right. It does make certain predictions which will be different to Ptolemy, which we'll see basically next. Right. It's a combination of these predictions, which were tested, uh, Kepler's laws of motion, and Newton, uh, which made the Copernican model the accepted theory of the solar system. So let's be, meet the next character, Tycho Brahe. So Brahe was born in 1546, three years after Copernicus died. Okay. And when he was 26, he noticed a new star in the constellation Cassiopeia. We now know that that new star that he witnessed was a supernova, and this supernova is named after him called Tycho. The king of Denmark, uh, Wilhelm IV, was enthusiastic in astronomy, right, just like people are now, and offered him a lot of money. So he often bought a ton of gold to set up an observatory on the island. And so basically about $60 million, basically it's a single dude, to uh, observe night sky. Now Tycho hadn't invented yet, so Tycho had to basically build instruments that are used in the naked eye to make very precise um, observations of the stars and planet. And because of this, because he was so careful, his careful observations against uh, of the planets made him the greatest observational astronomer in the in one thousand years up to that point. Okay. Um, now the next character we meet is Kepler. So Tycho had these really precise observations, right? And then Kepler comes along. Uh, so Kepler um, was a brilliant mathematician, and basically he was um, uh, recognized by Tycho Brahe as someone to um, keep in mind. So he invited young Johannes Kepler right, to help him analyze his story. So Tycho had a lot of data, but he didn't know how to, to make sense of it. So basically he got Kepler to come along and try to look at it. And Kepler found the observed planets of all the planets, all of Tycho's data that follow, follow from three simple laws. It took him 15 years from the time Kepler met Tycho to basically come up with the laws, but um, he did eventually do it. Right? So what he did was that he basically replaced the complicated machinery of Ptolemy's model with a few simple rules. So there are three rules he replaced them. So they're called Kepler's three laws of planetary motion. First law, planets move in eclipses with the sun at one focus. So it's not in circles anymore, but in squash circles called eclipses. Ellipses. The line from the sun to a planet sweeps out equal areas in equal time. So that means basically when the planet is close to the sun, it moves slightly faster, and when it moves slow when it's farther away. And finally, the period of each planet is related to its average distance to the sun by the formula P, which is the period, squared is equal to a, which is what's called the semi-major axis, or average distance, uh, q. We'll basically talk about this in a second. All right. uh, circle 
is basically a set of points that are the same distance from the center. So an ellipse is a set of points with, where some of the distance between two points is the same. So the two points are going to be foci of the of the of the um, uh, of the ellipse, right? Circle is just a special case of it where the two foci are exactly in the same point at the circle center. Okay, so this is how what a um, uh, eclipse light you can basically do create an ellipse by losing a string. You put two points, or do the two foci, and the string is constant in constant length, and you draw around it. Okay, and this, there's basically a minor axis, this is the smaller axis, and a major axis, this is the longer axis, and half that ma major axis is what's called the semi-major axis. Semi means half. There's also semi-minor axis because semi means half as well. Okay, so basically this is what we mean by equal areas and equal time. So the motion of the planet will sweep out an equal area in equal time. So when a planet is close to the sun, all right, the sun's at one focus, it sweeps out. Uh, it has to sweep out a larger angle because to keep the same area as this way. When it's farther away from the sun, it sweeps out a small area. And there are two special points in this uh, orbit. One's called perihelion, which is when the planet is closest to the sun, and one's called aphelion, when the planet is furthest away. <coughs> so planets move in ellipses with the sun at one focus, and the line from the sun to the planet sweeps out equal areas in equal intervals of time. So we're going to see an animation in a second of Kepler's second law. So this is an animation of that. So you can see as this planet moves away from the sun, in equal time, it must be by equal area, but because it's further away, it moves slower. So it goes through aphelion, and it moves closer to the sun again, because it needs to sweep out its equal area in equal time. It has to move over a larger angle. So very close to the sun, it sweeps out a very, very large angle in a short amount of time. Okay, and, uh, and the sh distance of closest approach is called perihelion. This is Kepler's third law. AQ, which is the A, which is the planet's average distance from sun in AU, astronomical units, uh, is equal to P squared. So AQ is equal to P squared, the planet's period in years, right? So planets move ellipses with the sun at one focus. The period of each planet is related to the average distance. The period is basically the time it takes to go in one complete orbit. It is related to average distance from the sun by the form of AQ equals P squared. Okay, so let's remind us of what semi-major axis is. So if the sun is at one focus and you draw a line from perihelion to aphelion, take half of that, that is the semi-major axis. Okay, so we're going to use this formula continuously for a number of different problems, right? And in your homework as well, as well as quizzes, right? So it's just keep in mind that the few pieces of information are going to be important. So first of all, a cubed is p squared and Earth has a period of one year and the same ma major axis of one AU. So this will be useful in just a second. All right, so let's basically go to um, the uh, camera and see how this works. So turn this on. There we go. There's my pen. So let's first keep in mind that basically um, AQ equals P squared. Okay. And let's look at the zero points first. We know Earth has a period. P is equal to one year. For A is equal to one AU. Okay? You can check this real quick. A cubed equals P squared. This is in units of AU. This is in units of years. So this is equal to one. Q is equal to one squared. 1 cube is 1, that's equal to 1, right, naturally, not rocket science. Okay, let's deal with this first, but hopefully you have your um, uh, um, uh, little chic out, okay? So the second one is going to be a planet is at 2 AU, so a planet is at 2 AU. 2 AU, okay, uh, what is P, the period, okay? So this is A equals 2, P equals question mark, because I don't know what P is. Let's write down the formula, A cubed equals P squared. So this is 2 cubed equals P squared. I don't know what P is yet. This is 8 is equal to P squared, which means that P is equal to square root of 8, right? Um, 
uh, we can get a calculator to try to figure this out. Um, I forgot mine today, so I'm going to just bring out my computer calculator. I'll show you how that works. Okay, um, and uh, hold on, bear with me for just a second. I have to turn on my video capture device. There we go. So now, okay, so I said that um, P is equal to square root 8. Okay, so P is equal to math dot square root of 8. I put a decimal there just in case. So what's P? That is 2.8. So let's go back to our camera now. Whoops. So this is equal to 2.8 years. Okay, great. So now let's look at the next problem. Whoops. Okay. Uh, two. Asteroid is at 3 AU. What is this period? P. So A is equal to 3 uh, in units AU. P is equal to question mark. AQ equals P squared. So this is 3 Q is equal to p squared a cube 3 cube is 3 times 3 is 9 times 3 is 27 27 equals p squared so that means that p is equal to square root of 27 right um in years now we can get this in terms of a unit um i'm not gonna uh tell you what that is uh i'm just gonna just calculate it for you so square root of 27 is 27 is uh, 5.2 roughly. So this is equal to 5.2 years, right? It's actually pretty obvious because like square root of 25 is 5. Okay, so number three, a planet right? is at 0 0.1 AU, what is P, what is this period? So let's write down again, A equals 0 0.1, P equals question mark, A cubed equals P squared, this means that this is 0 0.1 cubed equals P squared. So this turns out to be basically, um, uh, 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 so in here, it might be very useful to use scientific notation. Um, well, let's just do it this way. So 0 0.1 times 0. Point, actually, let's do it this way. This is 10 to the minus 1. Q is 10 to the minus 1 times 10 to the minus 1 times 10 to the minus 1. Okay. This is where powers of 10 is super useful. This one is... 10 to the minus 1 plus minus 1 plus minus 1 is 10 to the minus 3 is equal to p squared, right? So this is basically 1 over 1,000 is equal to p squared, right? Which happens to be roughly about 1 over 30, right? Uh, is equal to p, right? Which means that p is equal to, I think is uh, 0 0.03 or so. Okay, years. All right, this is approximately, if you do in calculus, you're going to get a much better answer. Okay, so that's moving what's called forward, right? So I give you A, you tell me P. You can also go quote unquote backwards, I give you P, you tell me A. So that's the next few examples. Let's do that. So number four, right, is a comet has appeared a thousand years. What's this distance from the sun? So comet has P equal to 1,000, okay? A equals question mark, okay? So write that down, A cubed equals P squared. So this is A cubed, is something I don't know. P squared is 1,000 squared, 
which is a cube is equal to 10 to the 3 times 10 to the 3 this is 10 to the 6 all right and so basically um, a cube equals to uh, a million 10 to the 6 turns out that that answer a is equal to uh, 100 or so okay so a is equal to 100 a u all right next one um uh, uh, five okay a planet has a period of 0 0.5 years so planet P equals 0 0.5 a equals question mark okay let's go ahead and calculate this thing out a cube equals P squared this is going to be a cube which is something I don't know is equal to P squared is 0 0.5 squared which is 0 0.5 times 0 0.5 which is 0 0.25 okay so a cube equals 0 0.25 which you can just plug in your calculator so it's basically uh, a is equal to the q root of 0 0.25 okay plug that in your calculator to get that so let's i'll just do that right now uh 0 0.25 and that happens to be about 0 0.63 years. Okay. Now for the last one, a satellite has a period of 10 years at the same measure of 3 AU. Uh, could that be the case? I'll let you answer that question. All right. So let's uh, turn off my video capture device and let's go back to our current lecture. All right. So, this is using. so the next person that we'll meet is Galileo. So Galileo uh, was uh, around the time 1564 to 1642, right? Uh, everyone's always, everyone who claims persecution always claims to be the next Galileo, but that leads, that uh, leads to be seen. So what was interesting for Galileo was that around the time Galileo was around, uh, there was a Dutch spectacle maker, Hans uh, Lippertur, in 1608, who invented the telescope. And so Galileo was a talented mathematician and physicist who at the time was trying to understand the Copernican system and uh, who did not really like, um, and, and the church really did not like the Copernican system and had burned um, the guy Bruno at the stake. Um, this is at the time, it was um, it was a uh, revival in, I guess, what's called religious fundamentalism at that period in time. And so basically, this seemed to be um, comparing systems for some reason or, or, or other seemed to be a system that the church did not like. Okay. So what did Galileo accomplish? So Galileo was the first one to apply telescope to astronomy. So the first person to make significant obs astronaut observations about telescopes. You might think that's obvious now, right, if they invented it. But in fact, this was not uh, something that was um, used. So he found that Jupiter had four moons, right? And turned out their orbits around Jupiter obey Kepler's law. He saw craters on our moon. He saw spots on the sun. And he basically found the sun rotates by watching how the spots move. He found that Venus has phases like the moon, and they agree with Perpignan, not the Ptolemaic model. Now we'll go back to in a second. And he also found far more stars and cluster stars than anyone has seen before. And showed the Milky Way, right, which is this band of white, in a nice sky is in fact not like a band of like white dust but in fact is a myriad of stars all right and also galileo's experiments rolling ball show that force is not needed to keep the object mo moving only change its motion right this is a central fact that will ultimately allow isaac newton to show kepler's law were really constant of single law which is the law of gravity okay <laughs> so this is the first difference between the ptolemaic model and the Copernican model, right? So, <coughs> uh, Galilei's observations verify the um, uh, Copen Copernican prediction and a few of those of the um, Ptolemaic model. So, for instance, if you look at Venus, right, in the Ptolemaic, in the uh, Copernican model, right, because Venus doesn't really change observationally from the past sun, you always see Venus basically going from new to waxing going bigger and bigger but never fills up right and goes back to new again and basically fades away right so you never see the full disk of venus right okay um 
this is another thing. Venus looks like, like a crescent in all parts of it. Now, Venus is too small. You can't see the crescent with your naked eye, right? But if you take a, a Copernian model, that's way different, right? So, for instance, like, you never see the full face of Venus, right? You see basically various fat crescents. Venus should look like a fat crescent at all times, right? But if you take the Copernican model, so the sun is centered, Earth rotates around the sun, sun vo Venus is basically closer to the Earth, you basically see Venus going through all the space. So basically, in this part, it looks like Ptolemaic model, you see crescents, but then it gets bigger and bigger and fills up to be full and fades away again, right? Okay? So the Copernican model basically shows that, um, predicts that the, at, the Venus should be a crescent when it's closest to the Earth, and basically it should be um, a glibus or full when it's furthest away from it. You never see it full because in order to see full, it has to be directly behind the sun, so you don't see it. But you see basically um, a, a, a large, a larger fraction of the surface that you see. So over a several month period, if you observe a telescope, this is what Galileo saw. You see, new, it's closer, so it looks bigger. So there's a crescent. And it gets further away, right, as it goes around the sun. So it's basically on the sun's backside now. So it's, it's much further away than it was initially. Then what you see is that Venus becomes a full disk, right? And changes from um, uh, largest when it's closest to smallest or glibus when it's fur furthest away, right? Galileo also discovered, so this is a very distinctive um, uh, difference between Ptolemy and Copernican model, and before the invention of the telescope, there was no way that this could have been um, observed. But Galilei observed it, and basically was uh, a big plus in favor of the Copernican model relative to the Ptolemy model. Galilei also discovered the four moons of Jupiter, so he discovered there are four moons on Jupiter. This is his notebook, actually. All right, so there's a small four moons, and these moons move around Jupiter. And shockingly, as he observed them, they found, he found that they obey Kepler's third law, which is AQ, which is the distance, average distance of the moon away from Jupiter, is equal to P squared, which basically tells you what the relative periods of these moons are going to be, and it followed Kepler's third law exactly. So here are basically the four moons of Jupiter, one, two, three, four. I forget the exact sequence of names, so I won't leave it. Leave it. And he also observed the moon itself. He observed the moon that had craters. So this is not like a perfectly smooth sphere like people had thought up to that point. But in fact, basically the mountains, the ridges, these things look very much like basically uh, the Earth might look like from space. All right. So there are mountains on Earth, ridges and river, valleys on Earth, craters, basically mountains and ridges and craters on the moon itself. Okay. So here are Galileo's important astronomical observation. He found the phases of the Venus, that agrees with Copernican model, that's a great big plus. He found craters on the moon, he found there were four moons of Jupiter, and these four moons obey Kepler's third law. He found that the Milky Way was basically a vast collection of stars, much more stars than people had thought. He found sunspots on the sun. Now, to see the sunspots, he did something really dangerous. He pointed his telescope at the sun. He shouldn't do that. All right. He did that, and he found that basically there are sunspots on the sun. He found there are rings of Saturn. All right, he didn't know at the time there were enough. They were rings. He just saw basically a central body and two fat bulges on the side. All right, and but he also made some essential contributions to physics, in particular, uh, basically on nature of motion. All right, so let's talk about Galileo and physics. All right, basically mechanical physics, like what, how the objects move. Right. So, the question becomes, what does the object do when there are no forces acting on it? According to the, the Greeks, basically, objects tend to stay at rest. Right? You have to basically, in order to get something moving, you also apply constant force, right? All right, so it comes to rest. So, so the question is, is the Earth at rest? So, if you like to create degrees, the Earth is at rest in the of the universe, that's because there's no, basically, force applying with the object. But there is, but the Earth, in fact, is not at rest, right? Um, uh, if you don't apply a force to the object, the object won't change its velocity, right? The speed and motion of its mo the speed and the speed and direction of its motion will remain constant. Forces just change the motion of, of a body. It does not basically a prerequisite for the object to move, right? So Galileo did a number of experiments. So for instance, he took a ball, he rolled it, and basically as it went down the inclined plane, it sped up. As it went up the inclined plane, it slowed down. 
and basically if it moves along a inclined plane, it basically stays constant. All right. <coughs> so, in principle, what he did was he set set a gently sloping plank, so twelve yards of thirty six feet in length, right, and made polished steel balls roll down narrow groove cut into it. So you would verify conjecture that the speed of the fall increased uniformly with time, right? So this is the law of uniform acceleration, one of the great moments in the history of science. So basically, the acceleration of the ball feels, the increase of velocity that the ball, ball basically is seen, increases uh, steadily with time, okay? Okay, and so from that, he basically saw that the effect of force is not to produce motion, but the change motion. You could speed up, slow down, or change direction. Okay, so by rolling balls and timing their descent, uh, Galileo concluded there, w that when there no force acts on an object, the object moves forever at constant velocity speed in a straight line. Okay, so this is the final meaning of the Copernican revolution. So there is, you no longer have an idea what absolute space is. It's basically a space where there is an absolute rest. Same stuff comes to rest, right? So there's no measurement you can make to find out whether you're moving or at rest. All right. Finally, let's enter Newton. Newton is widely considered the second greatest physicist of all time, okay, uh, after Einstein. All right. He basically established a few things. He established the laws of classical mechanics. He invented a reflecting telescope. And also he invented calculus, which is the bane of some of your existence. So what does the object do when there's no force on it? So after reading Galilei, Newton realized if no force is on an object, will not change the will not change the velocity, which is the direction and speed of the motion. The direction and speed of the motion will remain constant. Okay. Uh, in what direction is the force on the object that moves at constant speed in a circle? Then, all right, because uh, it's not a circle is not a straight line. Okay. Well, that force is toward the center of the circle, right? So, for instance, if you swing a ball over your head, there's a force that the court exerts on the, uh, the, 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 uh, the string or court exerts on the ball as you swing it. That force has to be along the length of the string, which is why, basically, in order to keep something moving at constant velocity in a circle, you basically have to have it, um, you basically have to have the, the force perpendicular to its motion. So, in this case, the direction changes, but the speed of the object stays the same. So, for instance, in this particular example, if the speed stays the same, you have to have a constant force directed toward the center in order for to basically move this thing at constant speed around a circle. Okay. So, what else moves in circle? Planets move in circles, right? And so, um, what he realized is that the gravity which draws objects toward the Earth, like sort of an apple that falls off an apple tree, is the same force that keeps the moon orbiting in a circle around the Earth. Otherwise, if there's no force on the moon, then basically the moon will fly off. And obviously, there's no string attaching the moon to the Earth, so that a string can't exert that force. So there must be this force called gravity. So this is Newton's law of gravity. Any two objects in the universe, in the universe will attract each other with force given by the following. F, which is the force, is equal to G, which is Newton's constant, uh, times M, which is the mass of the first body, M, which is the mass of the second body, divided by R squared, which is the separation between these two things. So in this case, R is going to be measured in meters, M is going to be measured in kilograms, and F will be measured in Newtons, where one Newton is equal to 4.5 pounds. i got to check that. And G is roughly 7 times 10 to the minus 11 uh, in these units. Okay, so how do orbits work? Okay, so what Newton imagined is that if you fire an object from a high mountain, all right, then this object will fall towards the Earth, all right, but it will fall some distance away. If you fire it faster, it will fire, it will fire it farther before it falls away. Fire yet faster, it will fire even further. But at some point, you will fire so fast that as it falls toward the Earth, the Earth, because of its coverage, because it Newton knew it was a round ball, would basically fall away at the same rate. And so in this case, basically, this would be an orbit around the Earth. All right? And eventually, if you stand there, it will hit you in the back of the head. Okay? 
So there are multiple kinds of orbits depending on whether or not the object is moving faster or slower than what's called as escape velocity, right? So if you move in a circle around, let's say, an object, let's say Earth or the Sun, you move in a circle, you're bounded there, you're going to move in a circle forever. As you basically move further and further, faster and faster, then you move in ellipses, and eventually you move in the parabola. So you basically go out to the to infinity and beyond, or, or in hyperbolas, right? And it turns out that these things, it turns out, is just a conic section. You take a cone, if you slice it across horizontally, you've got a circle, slice it as a slant, you've got an ellipse, slice it um, parallel to one edge, you get parabola, and slice it vert any other direction, you're going to get hyperbola. Right? So these shapes can be constructed by what's called the conic sections. So this is a side. Okay? So just to, to reiterate, so orbits that remain going around and around an object for which are called bounds or ellipses, and circles is just a special case of the ellipse, and unbound orbits are either parabolas or more slightly hyperbolas. Okay? So now, the force of gravity if you go back, is proportional to the mass of the bodies and the distance between them squared. Right? So the force on the object is proportional to R squared. So for instance, if you're on the Earth, that's your normal weight. If you move twice the distance, this is basically at the Earth's radius, your normal weight. If you move twice that distance somewhere in order, you're basically 1 over 2 squared, you're 1 quarter of the weight. Move three times, you're three squared, you're one ninth the weight. Four times, you it's one over four squared, you're one sixteenth the weight as much as the surface. Okay, so we're going to basically use Newton's laws of gravity in a few examples to get a feel of how this thing works, right? And in particular, um, we're going to vary both the mass and uh, r. So let's get out of here and let's go talking to our video capture device. And here we go, let's talk about our next thing. So let's use Newton's law of gravity. All right, so uh, F is equal to G M M over R squared. Actually, I'll use a little r, just like I use the notes. Okay, and so um, I have my optimistic weight here. So I weigh, so instructor is 180 pounds on Earth. All right, and what I mean by that is I'm sitting on the Earth's surface. All right, so basically R is equal to the Earth's surface, RE. M is the mass of the Earth. And basically M is my mass, little m, right? Because I'm not big M. And G is basically Newton's constant, all right? So in this case, F is gonna be 180 pounds, right? For these things, so this is equal to G, uh, M, Earth, that's my mass, divided by um, R squared, which is gonna be R E squared, okay? Okay, so the first thing. Number one, I'm on a planet the same size as Earth, but half the mass. So M now goes to one half M, right? Okay, I'm gonna write it as um, M E, so the mass of the Earth. So M go, E goes to one half M E, which is equal to the mass of the planet. So let's basically figure this out. F is equal to G M, uh, planet m divided by r squared. All right. Now same size as Earth, so r is going to be equal to r e. So it's going to be basically g m. M p is one half m e, but we'll put that in a second. That's m e divided by r e squared. Mass of planet is going to be g one half m e m divided by r e squared. Okay, so that's the one half g m e m divided by r e squared. So I just brought the one half out. Okay, so this thing we know already. Okay, that is that which 180 pounds. So one half times 180 is 90 pounds. Right. Basically, you can also do the same thing by recognizing that 
I'm going to take this to be half the mass of the Earth. So it's one half times the weight I feel on Earth, which is going to be 90 pounds in this case. Okay. Now, number two. Okay. So on the planet, same size as the Earth. So basically, again, R is equal to RE. Uh, but one tenth the mass, so M is equal to 0 0.1 Me. Okay, mass of planet. So write down again, G M P M over R squared. Let's substitute everything in. G M P is 0 0.1 Me. M, that's me, divided by R squared. That's basically the raised to the earth again. R E squared. Okay, 0 0.1. G M E M divided by uh, R E squared. You recognize this again? That's just that. 180 pounds. 0 0.1 times 180. So that's just going to be 18 pounds. Right? Very, very light on that planet. Okay. Next one. All right. So, so, so far we just varied basically the M. Here. Now we're going to vary this part in, which is the R. Okay, um, we're going to vary R here. Okay, let's do it. So the planet has the same mass as Earth, so MP is equal to ME, right? But double the radius, so R is equal to 2 times RE. Okay, write that again. F is equal to G MP M divided by R squared. So that's going to be G. So that's ME, right? That's ME. Uh, that's M again. That's me. I'm not changing in my mass. And now it's going to be basically be 2RE squared. So that's going to be 2 squared is 4. So 1 fourth GMEM over RE squared. Again, you recognize this quantity as this quantity up here. That's 180. So you go to 1 fourth of 180, which is, what is that? Uh, 18, that's a 4, 2, 5, 45 pounds. Okay. All right. Um, let's do another one. Number four. Okay. A planet with the same mass as Earth. So MP is equal to ME, right? But one third the radius. So R is equal to one third R E, right? Uh, that we'll just do it again over here. So uh, M P is equal to M E. R is equal to one third R E. All right. So let's go ahead and do that. So now this is going to be F is equal to whoops, G M P M divided by R squared. That's G. M E good. I'm not changing M. Divide by R squared is one third R E entire thing squared, right? So this is one third squared is one ninth, but it's one over one ninth, which is nine times G M E M divided by R E squared. And by now you recognize this pattern. This is again is 180, 180 pounds. So it's nine times one eighty, which is what? What is that thing? Uh, let me just do it. Zero. Nine times that's 72. That's a two. A seven on top. Nine plus a one sixteen forty. I think that's correct. And that's about right. Yeah. Okay. And finally, number five. Okay. So a planet that's both half the mass and half the radius. So MP of Earth, presumably. One half ME. R is one half R E. Okay, so this F is equal to G M P M divided by R squared. That's going to be G one half M E M divided by keep in mind one half R E squared. Okay, so it's going to be one half up here, and then one half squared is going to be one fourth there. G M E M over R E squared. So this is 180 again. And you notice that even though I divide both of them by half, 
because r comes to r squared, this is actually much larger, much, much, much more of an effect. So this can be 4 divided by 2. That's 2 g m e m over r e squared, which is 2 times 180, which is 360 pounds. All right. So that's basically our exercises in using Newton's law of gravity. The predictions of Newton's law were amazing. They precisely predicted the orbits of planets, moons, and comets. All right, it pre he predicted the reappearance of Halley's comet, and basically it was later used to discover Neptune from the discrepancy in the orbit of Uranus. This was predicted by Adams and Le Verrier much later. Okay, so let's understand how a concept of space and time changes with um, with um, with the Greek era all the way up to the Newtonian era. So in the pre greek era, the Earth is flat. There's a preferred direction, there's up, right? The Earth is, ex is at rest, Earth space is absolute, right? And we know what it means for two events to be occur at the same time, right? Time is absolute, so you know, um, yeah, you know what in the same place, and you know what it means for two events to occur at the same time, and space is flat, okay? By the time the Greeks rolled around, they realized the Earth is not a, a flat, it's actually a curve, right? Um, uh, some basketball players have not yet gotten the memo, right? Up depends on where you are because it's round, right? And Earth is at rest. Space is absolute. You know what it means for two events to occur at the same place. Time is absolute. You know what it means for two events to occur at the same time. And again, space is flat. By the time Galileo came around, so this is the meaning of Copernican revolution, Earth is curved. Up again depends on where you are, same as the Greeks. The Earth is now moving. It's not at rest, right? And so... Um, what events occur at the same place depend on whether or not on how the observer is moving. Time is absolute. You know what it means for two events occur at the same time. And space is flat. All right, and that's it for now.